slides? Yeah, I can, I can see your screen. So there's a slide number seven here. Uh, if you can test check with me. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a code here. You have to go to slido.com. And then you have to punch this code. Just let me know if it's this nav navigable. Yeah, it works now. So it's yes. Q and so A. Yeah. Is it showing you a question? Yeah. Not uh, yet. Not yet. No, no question. I can ask no. you. I can ask you a question. Yeah. Let no, no. Let me just check if this is. Just let me know if it's showing you any question now. What comes to your mind when you think of the word resilience? Is it popping up? Um, Let me know when it does. It probably has a little bit of lag. No? Oh, okay, got it. But what comes to your mind? When you think yeah, when you think of the word resilience, correct? Super. Yeah. Thank you. I think this works. So we just have to kind of get the camera on and then we are sorted. Yeah. In the meantime, I'll request all the students to please join the cameras. See, I'm gonna log off once and log on again, Nitesha. Give me just yeah, some time. Yeah. Sure, sure. like yeah, yeah, let, let's try that. Now. Hey guys, uh, those who joined, please turn on your videos. Just make sure you have the background. It's working, Nitish. Thanks. Perfect. I mean, just uh, give it two minutes and then we can start. Uh, sure, I, I'm good. All right, we see you.
All right, ma'am. We we can start. So just a brief introduction, ma'am. Um, so good evening, everyone. I'm Nitesh Dhulwani, and uh, I welcome Dr. Rupender Kaur on behalf of the GMB batch at Excelara Jamshedpur. Dr. Rupender Kaur is a leadership coach, an inclusion proponent, and a military veteran. She is an avid researcher and believes in evidence-based practice. And has coached over 150 senior leaders across the big four. Ma'am, we are elated to have you amongst us, and we look forward to get your insights on disruption and resilience, the growth mindset. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nitesh, and thank you, everyone, for being here on a Saturday evening, listening to a middle-aged forty-something self-styled consultant. who calls herself a leadership coach educator and researcher i mean really you don't have better things to do on a saturday evening maybe go watch a movie uh, go out with your girlfriend or boyfriend have a cup of coffee go out with a go out with your friends for a beer or maybe just go off to sleep exactly you can't do all of this right in the world that we are living in you know all the theaters and malls are closed your girlfriend or boyfriend is rather you know better having not too close because if you are not suffering from covid you're probably carrying one um the bars are all closed for all good reasons and of course you can't sleep because uh, you know you might just wake up with a nightmare and thinking that you're gasping for breath with an oxygen concentration level below 90 and not really being able to secure a bed or an oxygen cylinder for yourself yeah jokes apart that's i think the reality of life that all of us are living in right now and you like it or you don't like it for the next one hour you are um strapped with me so there is good news and there is bad news which one would you like to hear first the good or the bad the bad news bad bad news good news oh sir. my god the good people news grown so pessimistic people are wanting to hear the bad news first okay let's raise hands let me see how many votes go for good news and or you can type it in the chat how many of you say good news and how many of you say bad news oh wow that's okay that's that's quite a bit of good and bad equal distribution but since i am an optimist i would rather go with good news the good news is that all of you who become a student again yeah and a lot of you are coming with corporate experience and i i'm aware of that um but given the fact that you have this experience you are officially also holding the title of a student now which means that you can officially go to sleep in this classroom so all good for you the bad news unfortunately is that that the person that you're strapped with is a doctor by profession and has also done a stint in the indian army which means that i know a trick or two to make sure that the students in this class remain awake and one of the tricks that i learned pretty early in my army days and as an instructor is to ask the participants in the room a question okay and for that i need all the cameras switched on please yeah excellent thank you so here goes the question um if you have ever lost someone unexpectedly uh, who was very dear to you please raise your hand okay i see some hands raised up if you have faced a situation in your life where you felt that everything seems to fall apart and it's very difficult for you to get the pieces together just raise your hand okay a couple of hands more and if you have let's say lived through a disaster which or have been bullied sometime in your younger days school days college days 
um, or in the corporate world, and we know how corporate bullying is rampant, right? And have been made redundant in that space. Please raise your hand. There are a couple of people more who've raised their hands. Mm -hmm. Now, if I could invite all of you to really look around, unfortunately, uh, we are not in a physical space kind of a room, but if I could, you would see a couple of hands really raised up, which basically means that adversity doesn't discriminate. It happens with all of us. And if you're alive, at one point or the other in your life, you would have to go through something which is tough, which is difficult, which um, you know, was, was exhausting, which was uh, somewhere was pulling you down and you didn't know how to handle with it. So how do you handle those tough times with grace, with equanimity and with also courage is the topic that we'll be discussing today and still emerge not only resilient out of it, but also victorious. Yeah. Allow me to share my screen with you. And over the course of next 30 odd minutes, I'll be discussing and sharing my journey of some of those moments that I came across. And if I can share, and you can draw some learnings out of that journey, it will be a great achievement for me. But after that 30 to 40 minutes, um, if, we, if I can invite all of you to share your questions, your thoughts, and the dilemmas that you're going through, whether in the past, yeah, are we good to go? Yes, give me a quick thumbs up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma right. Good. So, um, Interestingly, I started studying resilience um, way back in 2002 when I joined um, the Indian Army, and that was my first alma mater. And this is, of course, me that you see in the uniform. Um, when I first joined the Army as a young captain in 2002, um, it was an amazing time to be there um, because I, I still believe that I learned my first lessons in grounding, in discipline, in moral courage only from bosses. Whether it was um, facing the tough times in a valley called Gurez, some of you may not have heard of, it's 200 kilometers ahead of Kashmir. At 15,000 feet altitude, uh, cut off from the rest of the world with 10 feet of snow, six months, no Russians, and no telephone connectivity. That was my first lesson in resilience and first lesson in surviving alone in, in, a, in a space where none of them felt like mine because I was coming from a very small town in Punjab called Sangrood and I didn't in, ever in my wildest dreams had imagined that I could be put in a place like this. Um, so while I traversed that journey and learned the grounding principles of courage, discipline and teaming, um, I completed my short service commission in the year 2008. Uh, given a choice, I could have continued. I would have loved to continue, but I didn't have that choice. And some of you may relate to that story because as women, there are enough and more other kind of challenges that you have to face. So I got married in 2004 and by 2008, I was blessed with a son. Um, and he was about three months old. And I had to make that tough choice of moving on from a profession that I loved um, to raising a family because my husband is still serving in the forces and he didn't have the choice and the liberty to quit because he's a permanent commission officer. Uh, so I moved, I took the baton on, um, but being the career woman I was, I didn't want my story to end there. So after two years of rearing my son and making him sustainable in, in the real sense of the word, I thought I need to do something about myself and which is where I joined Indian Institute of Management in Dor, and did exactly what you guys I enrolled uh, yourself today, which is executive MBA. Um, and, um, and that was my second les lesson in resilience, if I may call so, um, because, um, you know, here I was a trained doctor and didn't know the ABC of numbers. 
and I was peering down into the annals of financial management, accounting management, and so on and so forth. And uh, I sometimes felt like, you know, that boy in Tarizami Park with all the numbers floating in the air and, and, and you, know, you know, you don't know what you really do with it. Um, but then, yes, uh, I thought I'd not survive, but I prevailed. Um, and when I prevailed, I kind of um, uh, joined and completed uh, what you call the corporate world, the so-called corporate world. How many of you are coming with an average of three to four years of experience in the corporate world? Just raise your hands. Have served in one organization and then joined. Uh, okay. I see the numbers rising up. So it's about 20 people right there. 24. Out of 85, there are only 24 people with corporate experience, is it? Okay, good for you. For the rest of you who haven't really tasted the, the poisonous waters yet, just on being the lighter side. Um, you know, corporate world, as much as it sounds exciting, uh, rewarding, both financially and otherwise, is a tough nut to crack. And especially, um, more so for me, because um, I was coming from a place which was... Uh, which was the Indian Army, right? Which was um, which was also about each have a work ex of at least five years is what Ujwal is saying to me. So all of you are coming from the corporate world is what I'm hearing from Ujwal. So my bad. Uh, the good part is that you've seen five years in the corporate, which is why you'll be able to relate to my story when I say that I was coming from a place of um, you know inspired values of shared camaraderie of integrity of teaming, of uh, putting the people and soldiers uh, in your team before you. Uh, and interestingly, the corporate world is, is a little different. It's much more ambiguous, uh, less of structure. Um, it's more about self than team. As much as we talk about team, um, I have uh, really seen the kind of passion and compassion that we have in the forces. Now, that's not a comparative. But what I'm only trying to highlight is the difference in terms of the value system and sometimes how difficult it can be for you to fit into that mold. Um, but if you are steadfast, if you can hold on to your values over a period of time, you overcome that part too. And as if everything was not over, last year, just before the COVID happened, I stepped into my own independent consulting. Yeah. And, um, and at this point in time, when I took that plunge, my seniors and my people wh whom I had spent the last 15 years with, they actually tried to coax me into saying, why now? You know, you're almost at the brink of the top of your leadership game. And, uh, you know, you're serving in a big four. And there is only forward movement from here. And that's precisely the reason I said, why not now? Because, you know, I've done what I could in the last 15 years in the corporate world. I do not see any room for intellectual growth anymore. Um, I am only stuck with one kind of work and I want to expand my horizon. And which is why I want to disrupt myself. And which is actually the first big theme for today, which is really disruption. And I saw my entire career really broken down, which I had reared over the last 15 to 20 years to literally start from scratch. Now, disruption is not a new word, whether it's personal or it's organizational. And we've seen disruption, right, for the year or so. Uh, if I have to share with you some statistics about the recent disruption that all of us are facing, the numbers are really, really bleak. And I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of the numbers. Uh, but I want, what I want to highlight in this particular slide is something very simple. You know, if you look at the monetary loss of global gross domestic product, it's about 76.7 billion US dollars. And uh, look at the way it has affected not only the poor people, but even the middle class, even the, uh, even the richest of the rich who do not know whether they'll survive another day or not. So what does this disruption really mean for you? In the space that you are in, right? You're just entering your executive MBA. This is the first year or just, just about starting. 
and it's it's a very different environment right the way we are starting now compared to what it would have been uh, if you had joined a regular mba any thoughts what what does this disruption really mean for you would anybody like to take a plunge or maybe type in the chat leave the comforts of corporate world and coming back into the classroom so what does this mean for you koshik how will this disruption uh, affect you so affect you in the sense like um, sort of challenge like you know uh, for the four, past 5 years i've been working the same line and like you said like interacting with um, people from other lines other sectors and gaining the gaining appropriate knowledge from those sectors it will help me to grow as a you know, um from from a corporate yes. yeah absolutely uh going challenging yourself going into a different realm don't know how the future will look like pushing boundaries someone has said adjusting to a new normal you know this word has actually become viral now the new normal uh lot has changed of course you know in in the environment in in our personal and professional lives but a couple of things that it can have a direct impact on you is actually if i look at it from two perspectives beginning of a new virtual world unknown frontier absolutely you know the short term and the long term short term is of course the fact the way the education is is being delivered uh, you will see a fast change right everything is going to be online so the engagement the connections the networks sometimes even the even the pedagogical um, learning you know is different i'm not saying good or bad but yes it's different but the long term effect um could could actually be very very different it could it could mean uh, i wouldn't say it could it would mean shrinking of the academy economy and a uh, lesser number of placement opportunities but it could definitely mean different kind of placement opportunities or opening up of new industries which never existed before or some of you may really want to think about given the fact that this is so disruptive how do i use this knowledge and education that i have gained to not only look at a placement but also look at um, it from an entrepreneurial angle so uh, you know you may have to widen your lens and see how will this disruption really really um, affect me in the long run to me um, if you are fundamentally disrupted on a personal and professional level what is it that you can do about it what do you think is it that you can do about it um, as an individual let's say somebody comes and shakes up your world and and this is something that you had never imagined right so what do you really do about it one day at a time one day at a time i love that was that nitesh start all over again okay i think um hi ma'am uh, looking at things objectively is uh, i mean without uh, getting more into uh, you know the things that are disrupting you uh, but uh, you know pushing your focus over the things that you can do that are in your control is well excellent this is what what stephen kavi calls span of influence and span of control so you may not uh, be able to make the changes in your span of influence but you may be able to make changes that you can in your span of control so identifying what is it that you can change is i think the first step so uh, if i try and combine with what all of you have shared with me in the chat and i see a lot of you have actually contributed which is focus on what you can do adapt accordingly um, to the challenge prioritize tasks so on and so forth fundamentally you know there are a couple of things that you can do when disruption hits you and disrupts hits you very very hard what is it that you can do um adopt disruption as a way of life do not challenge it do not fight with it do not look at uh, denying it just accept it acceptance is the first uh, you know corner step make resilience your armor and we'll talk more about it as we go along how do you ensure that you have a protective coating of resilience that you know you, you you remember as a child we used to have that toy when we used to hit back it used to bounce back on us uh, i don't know how many of you have played with it i have definitely played and i've got it for my children also that's such a fond remembrance of you know keep hitting back at me i'll keep coming back at you and you know ensuring that i have resilience 
And finally, how do I don't a growth mindset, not only to, um, you know, keep uh, growing in the profession that I am, but also thinking two steps ahead and imagining what could change in the world in the future, which I can be prepared for. So let's take one thing at a time. When I talk about disruption, some of you have given me some very beautiful points about, you know, how can we really ensure that uh, we, we look at disruption as a way of life? What is it that we can do to ensure that we don't get tied back, uh, you know, with disruption and so that the disruption doesn't really um, tie us tie us really down. So let me uh, you know, share with you a, a bit of my story, which I shared with you a little earlier back also, but I just want to bring one more point here. Um, you know, when I, was, um, when I was looking at moving on to a different career, um, you know, and thinking that I, I've, I'm done with the current space that I am in, um, I looked at it from the perspective to say, uh, what is it that I can do to ensure that I kind of keep moving um, on the skill set that I want to achieve? And a simple thing that I could think was that, you know, if I have to look at disruption in a manner that that disruption creates value, then I have to figure out a way to find a need in my space which is not currently met. So for example, you know, um, this is a batch of, let's say hypothetically about 100 odd people, right? In executive MB, or maybe they might be a little lesser than that. So you will have to constantly challenge yourself to say, you know, what will I do after I complete this MBA or during the two years that I'm doing this MBA, which will solve a need which is not being solved right now? And that's a fundamental question that you definitely need to, to kind of constantly keep asking yourself. Yeah, because otherwise, by the end of two years, when you have completed your MBA, you will, you will find that, you know, you're pretty much, you're pretty much the same lot, right? You're not really different from the rest. So what is that value that you bring onto the table, even if with your specific experience, even with an MBA, what is it that you can bring onto the table? In alignment with what you can bring onto the table, identify uh, your disruptive strengths. And when I say disruptive strengths, what I basically mean by that is, what is it that you can do, which no one else can do like you? Yeah out of the skills, let's say out of the 10 skills that a finance MBA will need to have, which is that one or two things that you can do, which no one else can do like you. You know, if I, again, if I go back to my example, you know, in my space, there are probably hundreds and thousands of leadership coaches, you know, and especially as consultants. But when I started looking at my own trajectory a year back, I realized that, you know, I have something which I call, um, you know, the, the, spatial intelligence, Howard Gardner's multiple spatial intelligence, wherein I can connect the dots from multiple spheres of um, research and academia to bring relevant points uh, for people to make practical use of it. And, you know, the academia and the corporate world, till this time, are two parallel verticals. And somehow, there is very less intersection between what is taught and what is practiced. And you're coming from corporate experience, right? So you would remember in your earlier, um, you know, education, whatever education you've had, at least 60% or 70% of what you studied in colleges is what is not practiced in corporate world. In fact, when I joined corporate, uh, you know, I realized that uh, even if a fresher knows excellent PowerPoint skills uh, and Excel, I think their job is done, right? For the first three or four years. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, if, if even if you're good at that, you probably kind of, uh, you will survive. Um, and the third thing to look at is step sideways. I say disrupting yourself. I'm looking at it purely from a personal disruption point of view. You know, gone are the days when there were, when there were uh, people used to get a job and die with the same job. In the current scenario, people change jobs at least five to six times a day. Oh, sorry, five to six times in their, in their lifetimes. And, and careers also, they change at least twice to thrice. 
remember there's a difference between switching jobs and changing careers. Career is a total transformation of what you were doing earlier to what you start doing. So even today's time, people are opting for career changes at least twice to thrice, and which is a good thing to do. Uh, not only because um, you know it helps you improve your creativity potential, but it also gives you more opportunities. And I can give you a couple of examples here. I, I don't know how many of you have heard of the name Clayton Christensen. Um, anyone? Just raise your hand if you have. If you haven't, then after this session, you must go and read up on him. He's called the guru of disruptive innovation. And innovation is a key ingredient in any business that you go. Um, when I was in a consulting firm, which is of course EY, about 20% of an annual budget currently is invested in creating new innovative technologies. And every organization, and I'm assuming here that most of you would pass out this EMB are at least looking for some kind of a better corporate experience. So you may need to kind of acquaint yourself what is going on around the market with regards to innovation. So coming back to this, this question about Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen was now called the guru of uh, disruptive innovation and he coined this term somewhere in 2011. He was actually a regular corporate worker working in material science industry for about 40 years. At the age of 40 is where he chose, he said, you know, I want to go back to Harvard for pursuing my doctoral program. And he did. And after that, he invented a framework of disruptive innovation. And across the world, now he's teaching, he's uh, consulting, and he's, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's, uh, you know, he's a professor with Howard. So if that is not stepping sideways to grow, I don't know which better example to give to all of you to kind of think laterally. And finally, let your strategy emerge. See, a lot of us, again, you know, who I, I'm sure some of you must have taken strategy as a subject or want to specialize in strategic, strategic execution and so on and so forth. To my mind, strategy and execution are pretty much interrelated, you know, and in my 25 years of experience, that's how it's kind of come across. And especially when you're looking at innovating yourself, do not wait for a strategy to happen. Think, think big, start small, action, experiment, fail, think again. That's the strategy to adopt. So I typically follow the 4F formula, which I call fail fast and fail forward. Yeah. If you fail, which is inevitable to innovation, make sure that you learn something from it, which is fail fast and fail forward. So if you can keep these four fundamental rules and principles in mind, I think you will have started uh, on the way to innovation. And I usually call this in my talks, you know, we typically keep investing in company resources for companies to innovate and we forget the people who are really responsible for innovation are the individuals. So the best way to start for economic innovation is to start innovating with the individuals. And that's where we are today. And that's here's the starting point. Yeah. So this is the first point which I spoke to you about, about disruptive innovation. The second thing that I want to cover with all of you today is what, what I call, um, you know, make resilience your armor. Um, but before I go there, I want to quickly check with all of you, what does the word resilience mean? You know, the, the, resilient, the word resilience has actually become a buzzword. If you go on Google, you'll find it's been searched more than 10 million times in the last one year. Uh, having said that, I want to understand from the group here, the esteemed group participants of XLRI, what does resilience mean to them? And for that, I have a very quick poll. I request all of you to go to slido.com on your devices that you're logged through, either through that or your mobile and then join a poll uh, with the code which is given here, which is hashtag 62263. And let me know if you can see a question there. There's a question which I've put there for all of you to answer, which is what comes to your mind when you think of the word resilience? Can you see that question? Ma'am, yes, can you tell us the code again? Yeah, sure, please. Sure. Uh, let me just share my screen. It is otherwise um, hashtag 62263. Let me also share my screen with all of you. Okay. Can you see it now? I hope all of you have been able to join on this one. 
Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and can you see the question? What does the word resilience mean to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, Pop, just write one word that comes to your mind uh, when you think of or when you hear the word resilience. Okay, that's interesting. Determination, challenging yourself to grow, bounce back, durability. Very, very interesting words there. Okay, bounce back, strength, perseverance. Can, can you see the word cloud that all of you have formed on my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Survival, intact, keep going, stubborn, mental battle, tough. Phoenix, wow, that's lovely. Who's written this work? Rides from ashes, Phoenix, huh? Okay, never give up, tenacity, pliability, stand up after every punch. Very interesting. And if I have to, if I have to, you know, extrapolate the word and ask you this question, why do some people, you know, suffer real hardships and they do not falter? Um, and we've all seen that happen, right? In our personal and professional lives, one person cannot seem to get the confidence back after a layoff, uh, but another person persistently depressed takes, um, you know, takes just no time to kind of bounce back and be on the job with the same kind of vigor and enthusiasm. What exactly is that quality of resilience that carries people through life? What do you think makes people bend and then bounce back? Some of you have said, would determine persistence, with determination, with strength. Um, why do you think it's? Why do you think it happens? Anyone can kind of put that their thoughts in the chat. Not to give up, willpower, self motivation, uh, determination, attitude to survive, mental strength. Okay. Hmm. Those are some very interesting words that I'm seeing here on, on, on my desktop and in my chat. And I'm just putting some words here on the slide because this is what you gave me. You know, I have not given you, these are the words that you gave me. But if I have to talk about my research and my reading of the existing literature available on this, and there's about 40 years of science which talks about resilience. The definition of resilience is that it's being defined as the capacity to rebound back from adversity and conflict, progress and increased responsibility. And Zahar et al in his research paper highlighted two aspects of resilience, which is recovery and sustainability. And if I have to add one more into this, I will say it's not only the ability to bounce back from adversity and grow and progress. It's also the ability to foresee um, and prepare in advance of an impending crisis that may come through. Of course, no one can predict crisis, right? But do I have the ability to prepare even if I don't see a full cri a crisis? And I'll share a couple of examples with you on how people really did that and how you can do that too. Um, you know, given the fact that it's a skill that can be learned. Um, but those are really interesting answers here. And I'm going to, you know, I, I remember um, when I started researching a couple of years back and I started my research with the business because I was in a consulting space any which ways. And I was talking, not long ago, I was talking to a senior partner in my erstwhile uh, consulting firm about how to really land the best MBA students, yeah? something which is very close to you maybe at this point in time that all, all of the consulting firms go looking for talent, right? And they try and go to prestigious colleges. So I, I asked him a very pointed question to a senior partner in the firm that how do you really land, how do you really choose, how do you identify the best MBA students for our organization to work? And the partner really ticked off a long list of qualities for me. He said intelligence, ambition, integrity, analytic ability, and so on and so forth. 
And then because I was researching about resilience, I actually asked him, what about resilience? Um, and he reflected for a moment and he said, well, that's very popular right now. It's the buzzword. Um, and, and candidates tell this to us ourselves. They voluntarily say that, you know, we are resilient. Uh, they, they hold this information for us. But you know what, Rupinder, he said, um, you know, frankly, I think they are just too young to know much about resilience because resilience is something that you realize once you've been hit with something really strong. Um, and it's, it's something that happens to you after the fact. Um, you know, but then being the person that I am, I kind of persisted and I asked him, would you test for resilience? You know, does it really matter in business? And um, let's let's call this senior partner, Mr. Malik. And Mr. Malik is a man in his 50s and he's a very senior partner in the firm, very successful personally and professionally. And he started his life as, um, you know, so he was born to a poor farmer in, in, a, in the city of Ranchi. And at 10, he lost his father. And he continued to study with his mother's meager income. He reached the university, he cleared his CA because that's a typical way you get into a partnership firm, chartered accountancy, as we call it. Um, he got married, he got divorced, he has raised three children. And you know, then in the midst of something, he did 10 years of consulting firm, then he started to get into his own entrepreneurial venture, lost out a lot of money and came back to the firm again. Now that's the history of Mr. Malik, yeah? Um, and after reflecting for a while, Mr. Malik said, yes, resilience matters. Um, in fact, um, in fact, it matters probably more than any of the other qualities that we look for in MBA students. Does it ring a bell? Let me give you another example. Um, and that's more from the literature that I have read. This was a real example. Um, you know, Dean Becker, who's the president and CEO of Adaptive Learning Systems, a company which trains, trains people on resilience, um, says that a person's level of resilience determines who succeeds and who fails in the long run, whether it is um, Olympics, whether it is sports, whether it is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, academia or whether it is boardrooms. So it is the quality of resilience which really makes um, a huge amount of difference in a person's success and failure. And that's how important it is. So if, if it is that important, and if all of us understand the meaning of resilience, how do you think we can develop this quality, this elusive quality of every time you fall, you bounce back from adversity? What do you think are one, two, three things that we can do to develop resilience? And what has worked for you, maybe? Not looking backward, first to be better, if not the best. It's not the end of the world. Excellent. Okay, mindset, self motivation, face the situation. What else? Keep going with, my, sorry, keep going with, uh, take a day off and then carry on with a new perspective. Practice resilience for everything that we do. Yeah, it's, it's more of um, what all of you are saying. It's more of a daily meditation kind of a thing rather than a one-off uh, skill set that you can acquire. But let me share with you what are some things maybe that have worked for me and what is it that science says about it. Um, how many of you heard of the story of the donkey who kind of fell in the well and could not come out? It's a very interesting and a very simple story. They say that there goes a story by the, by the fact that there was a donkey who fell in the well and um, you know uh, the farmer whose donkey it was thought the donkey was anyways very old. So let me just put some um, you know, keep putting some, let me gather the village and I'll probably take sand and pour over the donkey and let him bury in the well. Now, interestingly, uh, so people came with their spades and their uh, cowls and they started putting sand over the donkey. And there were one shovel, two shovels, three shovels people put 
And the donkey very smartly dusted the dust off and the dust settled down and the donkey stood on the top of the dust, you know. And so, and this carried on for a while till the, the, till the time the donkey actually moved to the top of the well. Yeah. So look at the way, the perspective the donkey took to make sure that whosoever was trying to put him down actually got the better of it. Yeah. Um, there's another story which a mother was telling her daughter, um, which is about the carrots, eggs, and the coffee beans. And, um, you know, I tell this often to my eight-year-old girl. She's, she's, she's pretty resilient, I think, at this age also. And um, because, and the reason that I say is that because she never lets me go off to sleep without a story, even if I'm super and dead tired. So make sure that I have a story to tell to her. So one day I told her this story, which is again, a very interesting one, which a mother was telling to her daughter and the daughter was really feeling down because her friends were not uh, playing with her. They were bullying her and they were, you know, typically the way it happens in groups of young girls and boys when they play together. So she told her a story where she said, look at, look at these three things, you know, and if you take these three different things and boil them in, in, a, in a bowl of water, you know, look at carrots. What happens to carrots when you boil them? They become soft, right? What happens to eggs? They become hard. What happens to coffee? It leaves a flavor of its own for you to cherish for a long, long time to come. So at the end of the day, you have to decide for yourself which out of these, the water is the same, the temperature is the same, the conditions are the same. And each one of us, uh, as I mentioned earlier, will rise or fall depending on how we react to situations. And that's pretty much what resilience is all about, isn't it? So I'm here giving you a very simple three-step formula of building resilience if you don't have one, or if you are wanting to improve on one, or if you're trying to increase on your resilience, because resilience is a lifelong skill. Yeah, it's, it's not that I can come back. You might face larger, complex, um, difficult, more toughening challenges uh, as you go along your personal and professional life. So here is a three-step formula, 3A formula as I call it. Realistic optimism, search for meaning, and ritualized improvisation. What, is this, what does this really mean? What do I mean when I say realistic optimism? What do you think it means? What do you think it means? When I say realistic optimism, uh, optimism is optimism. Why am I adding the prefix realistic to it? Ma'am, I think uh, for me, uh, I mean, I can speak for me. Uh, it says that, uh, you know, hardships don't last. I mean, time is like a pendulum and, you know, it goes both ways. So uh, it goes to the positive side and it goes to the hardships as well. So, you know, nothing lasts uh, for a long time. Uh, is the key uh, for, you know, realistic optimism for me. Thanks, Niharika, for sharing that. Anyone else? Um, good evening, ma'am. Um, for me, I feel that realistic optimism would be something that um, is not just bookish, but is something that I can believe. Um, it's not something, it's not uh, the idea of blindly believing that, yes, um, the conditions are going to get better, everything's going to be fine overnight. Realistic optimism would be something um, which would motivate you in a way um, that things are bad, but they aren't as bad as we probably make them out to be. So something which is um, relatable and, op and a type of optimism which would be relatable on a day-to-day -day basis would be realistic optimism for me. Yeah, thanks, Arya, for sharing that. One, something which is relatable and which is also real. Right? It's not that I'm drowning in the sea of optimism. And they will pour dust on me or they'll pull up a, a you know, rope for me. It may or may not happen. What is the reality of the current situation is also what I have to realize. I have to be sure about. I cannot go to the moon with a Tesla, even though I may be optimistic about it. That's interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Sarisha. Yeah, the idea is very simple. You know, a common belief about resilience typically is that it stems from, uh, from a feeling of optimism, right? So if you think good, if you feel positive about it, you'll in, probably come out of it yourself. You know, that's true as long as your optimism does not distort your sense of reality. 
let me help you understand this by an example. How many of you have read the book Jim Collins, Good to Great? None? Girls and boys, start reading books. If there is one advice that I can give you in this session, um, there are two things that can change the trajectory of your life. The books that you read and the people that you meet. Otherwise, you'll keep continuing the way you are. So make sure that you start reading and just make down, note down the list of books that I'm sharing with you here. These are life-changing books and not only personally, but even professionally as you go in senior leadership positions, uh, steering important roles and designations in corporate organizations. So this book written by Jim Collins, Good to Great, is where he interviews a very senior um, admiral from the Navy, Jim Stockdale. Jim Stockdale is very famous for a, a fundamental which we call the Stockdale Paradox. He actually read, led a mission uh, wherein he, he took a, a, you know, in a, a Navy uh, soldiers to kind of a very difficult expedition. And he was held prisoner, unfortunately, and tortured by the Vietnamese when the war was going on for almost eight years. Um, and um, Jim Collin asks um, uh, Stockdale that, uh, you know, Tell me who did not make out of those concentration camps of Nazis, right? Who are the people who could not make it out? Um, so he said, you know what, uh, Jim, that's easy for me to answer. The optimist didn't make it out. You know what they said, um, because the optimist kept thinking, we will get out of this concentration camp by Christmas. No, no, no. Okay, Christmas has passed. We'll get it out by 4th of July for sure, because, you know, nothing is going to happen to us after that. And 4th of July went and they could not get out. And then they said to themselves, okay, we'll come out of the concentration camp by Thanksgiving. You know, that's in November. That also came and went. So, you know, by the time next Christmas came, it just broke off their hearts and they died off and they survived to failed optimism. You know, and contrarily, resilient people have a very down to earth or a realistic, realistic view of what needs to be done for survival, and especially in those extreme conditions. Yeah, even in these conditions, if I can draw an analogy to it, we are in extreme conditions. So while we may be optimistic, we we'll still need to be realistic of how the economy is changing, how the business world is changing how the opportunities are dwindling down. Maybe there's an opportunity for me to create something new. I may not fit into the, um, you know, the mold that already exists. Now, let, let me not dehearten you. I'm not saying optimism doesn't have its place. It, it does. Um, but what I also have to do is, do I understand the reality of the situation? And does my organization understand, if you are in a role in an organization, does my organization understand the reality of the situation? In the absence of these two questions, you may fall into something which is called denial. Yeah, I'll close my eyes despite knowing the fact that there's something very serious in front of me. And facing reality, um, really facing it is very, very tough. It's grueling, if I may say so. It's tough. So which is why you know, developing that capacity is, is, is very, very important and critical. And having a foresight to develop that is even more critical. Is, is this making sense to you? Is it landing well? Are there any questions or thoughts? Because I think I've been speaking for a while. I have two more points to share before I close, but I'm happy to take thoughts and questions if there are any at this point in time. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, does uh, resilience, uh, realistic, uh, optimism as you have shared so i as for me i just wanted to share that i think realistic uh, word signifies the facts that we are facing in the life as you have shared the story of the jews in the concentration camps so they were not being realistic that something is happening to them they were just optimistic about the future and there is no harm being optimistic but they you have to face the facts as well like what is going on right now so i think uh, i connected with that so i just want to share yeah, thank you, Apurva. And you said absolutely right. And I'll quote another example, maybe from the concentration camps and also some of the other crisis situations, which should help you connect the dots even better. But what you said is absolutely right. And I'm happy that you resonated with it. Okay, anyone else? Um, uh, I do have a question here uh, from the example of Jews. 
um and it's uh, something like um i mean it's a point that you said about denial nihal ka there's a bit of disturbance in your voice i'm not sure um hello is it me only or are the others able to hear niharika properly there is a disturbance you can type it in the chat if it's okay okay sure sure anyone else any thought or a question that you might have yeah hi uh, my name is deepika so uh, just on that part of having a positive approach to that optimistic belief so i have a tendency of chasing things till my last end like until i realize i'm not sure that it is not worth chasing but until i realize that it is not worth chasing or the hard work that i have been putting into uh, my go into way i have already invested a lot of the share of my energy into being really optimistic about it and working towards it so what is the line that we should draw that we should realize that you know it's not worth chasing anymore Hmm. That's a very, very interesting question and a very intriguing one. So I have just one answer to it, Deepika. You know, uh, something that I call context is king. Okay, and nobody understands your context better than you. You may want to seek out, and a typical tendency in difficult situations for us is, uh, you know, when we have tried everything, we seek out and we check other people's opinions and thoughts. you know is it really worth it what do they say about it um in these kind of situations the best line to draw is always a line which you decide for yourself nobody else can decide it for you because your context um is something that you understand the best having said that um you know you may not want to give up at the first try once you have understood the context around it um your own strengths yeah which is again uh which is again something which you have to spend enough time and um, space with because typically you know uh, you know we i i call it um um i call it actually the four uh four eyes of identity you know when we are raised as children um, there's something which is an identity which is given to us your mother or father would actually have said these are your strengths your teachers would have said these are your strengths you you do this best and then you created an identity for yourself which is which is really your like your remembered identity from childhood and as you grew up your peers talked about certain strengths of yours and you thought you know okay these are your strengths and that is reflected identity the third identity which is actually the very important and critical one which is called the created identity is something that you create for yourself i'm going to take a pause here for you to really internalize what i'm saying um we may not realize the power of it but we are the product of stories that we tell ourselves at all given points in time there is an internal script that is running in your mind yeah you have this strength you have this opportunity area yeah? you have you are good at this you are good at bad at this and in fact so much so sometimes you end up saying you know um that i am hard working i am so and so so you start equating your qualities with who you are and believe me you you limit yourself by saying that you know i if i these are three traits or four traits that i have i am being defined as i am this but you are not that only you are much more than that and which is why the concept of creating identity is very important so if you ask me the realisticness only is limited to the environment or the context around you but optimism is eternal yeah so you need to keep that feeling of optimism alive and wait for the context to change if you believe in what you want to achieve let me help this this is a lot of gyan that i'm giving you let me help you give understand that by an example so for example you know i am in a managerial position okay let's say in an ex firm and uh, despite my putting in my best despite my giving it hard working despite putting 12 hours and so on and so forth um i am stuck in that role you know i know that i have the capability to move up i have the hard work and the discipline to deliver 
I also have the intelligence to smarts, but there is something in the environment or the context which is not helping me move forward. Now that context could be that the organization doesn't have enough vacancies. It could be that your manager is a XXX who doesn't want you to move forward. It could be so on and so forth. But if you believe in the strength of the work that you do, you keep optimistic about it, you keep working towards it, and by God's grace, another two or three years when the context changes, you know, your optimism will thrive. So just to answer your question, the fine line is for you to define depending on the context that you are operating in. Does that help you answer that question, like your question? Yeah, for now, yeah. For now, yes. Let's connect offline on this if you want to have a further discussion. I'm just mindful of the time. I'll, sure, I'll have to, yeah. Happy to do that. Okay. So this is the first principle, moving from uh, optimism, learned helplessness to realistic optimism. The second principle for all of you to look at is finding meaning as a means of being resilient. Now, what do I mean by that? When I say find meaning as a ways of building resilience, what is meaning really? It's a very abstract word again. What comes to your mind? Nitesh, how much time are we left with? I'm sorry, I, can, I cannot um, see the time at this point in time. Do we have five or seven minutes? It's, it's 4.58. Yeah, we can go on. I'll try to wind up in five minutes and then I'll take some questions. Sure. Okay. The purpose and motive to push beyond, address the why, um, you know, we have you ever heard, and I'm sure you must have somewhere in your life, when people go through an adverse situation and they say, uh, you know, why is this happening to me? Why only me? Why do I always keep getting the shit? Why do I only am at the brunt of, uh, you know, receiving? And some of those people actually, over a period of time, start looking themselves as victims. And frankly speaking, I was also one of them a few years back when I was sharing with you that I felt stuck in a role. Actually, the example that I shared with you, Dipshika, had happened with me. So I felt stuck in a role and everything that used to happen to me, you know, uh, when I didn't get a good project, when I was not moved up the ladder, when I was not getting what I wanted in terms of respect, in terms of uh, recognition, I thought, why is this happening to me? And this is what I call the victim mindset. I, you know, I have a very close, this is of course from the corporate world, but I have a very close friend by the name of Ashu Jindal, and uh, she's suffering from a disease called um, SLE. This is, this disease is actually systemic, systemic lupus erythematosus, in which progressively there is muscle dystrophy, and over a period of time, you know, uh, people lose their ability to move, they go on a wheelchair, and so on and so forth, and she's been on it for the last 10 years, and and uh, so, so she's now working as a dentist uh, in a wheelchair in a small clinic in Delhi. And when, uh, you know, when people ask her, how can she even smile uh, despite the fact that she's going through such a tough time? And um, she gives me the same example. She says, you know, what happened? That typically people ask, why me? And I ask myself, why not me? Uh, because when I ask that to myself, you know, I, and I look back and see, there are so many friends who really helped me come to terms with what I am right now. So there's so many people who've extended a helping hand to me. And there are so many people who draw inspiration from me, right? Who see me in this chair and they say, okay, wow, if she can do this, maybe we, you know, we, we are really, uh, you know, way behind her and we should not look at the current circumstances and victims and rather see how can, how can we reverse the equation to answer the question, how can I overcome the situation? And which is where finding meaning. I'm going to quote again from a book called um, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Lovely book again, again on, on, on concentration camps in Nazi. Um, 10 million copies sold in 24 languages translated. Very small book if you haven't read that. Okay, Nitesh says he's read that. Oh, lovely, you have it right in front of you. So do you know what I'm going to quote from here, Nitesh? I'm, I'm still reading it, so I, I would like to uh, like for it to come from you. Sure. 
So, you know, Viktor Frankl, again, is, is a part of those Nazi concentration camps, and he's a psychologist by profession. And typically, to survive in those concentration camps, he had to, on an everyday basis, he had to exchange a cigarette for a certain amount of meal from the guard. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, you never used to get that meal, per se. And he saw people left, right, and center dying. And uh, suddenly, one fine day, he was left with only one cigarette. And he said, oh, my God, this is only one cigarette that I'm left with. And so, which means that I can only have one bowl. What will I do after that? And when he was thinking that, the whole enormity of the situation landed on him. He said, what has my life come to? I am I'm looking at a bowl of cereal to survive. And I'm thinking that the guard may or may not give this to me. How will I survive in this situation? Which is where... Uh, he sat down with himself and he said, you know, I need to do something about it. And which is where he said, okay, I'm going to tell this to myself every day. If I survive this concentration camp, I'll go back and I will write a book on how do you survive in a concentration camp? And he imagined himself taking, and this is real, huh? all of this is not imagined. This is all real. Because he went back, he survived the camp, he wrote the book, and he took the lectures. So, and the book is the right testimony of it Nitesh has in hand. And this is something that really helped him survive the entire Holocaust. So he found meaning in that little imagination for himself. And um, which is where I think um, it's very important and critical for all of us to define why we are doing what we are doing, to come across as resilient. If you don't have that answer to why, you will realize over a period of time, you will lose all motivation to progress. And especially in the face of setbacks, you will not be able to thrive. Okay, with this, I'm going to give you one last point on being resilient and a growth mindset. Um, this is, of course, a quote from Viktor Frankl, which is everything can be taken from a man, but one thing and the last of the human freedom, which is to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances and to choose one's own way. I'm not saying that by choosing you will become successful. Please don't get me wrong. But at least the choice lies with you, which is the most important thing. Yeah, You may fail, and you may fail multiple times, but that's what adversity and resilience is all about, right? Okay, and the last story that I'm going to share with you, sorry, is none other than from my own Alma Mater, which is a story of Major General Cardoza. Um, and Major General Cardoza is actually fondly called as Kartu Sahib. Um, the story is set in the year 1971, where India was waging war with Pakistan to help expedite the liberation of Bangladesh. Now, Major Major Cardozo's battalion was four by five Gurkha rifles. In our terms, we call GR. And he was actually at that point of time posted in, um, he was doing his defense services staff course in Wellington. And this is one of the most prestigious courses that army officers go through. So he was doing that. But unfortunately, his, his commanding officer was um, uh, lost in the battle and he was called at a very short span uh, to kind of lead the battalion um, in, in Pakistan, East Pakistan, and he had to leave immediately. So he left um, and the battalion successfully defeated Pakistan in a swift operation for 13, which lasted for 13 days. After the fall of Taka, the, when Indian army was, um, you know, capturing prisoners of wars, Major Cardozo unfortunately met with an accident uh, which changed his life forever. And what was the accident was that he stepped on a landmine. You know, typically in the armed areas, you lay down landmines so that the army cannot cross certain frontiers. So un uh, uh, unknowingly, he stepped on a landmine and which kind of blew away most of his leg. And just a portion of his leg remained attached to the torso. Now, in that area, there was no hospital and there were no medical facilities available. So there was only a part-time doctor that too from the Pakistani army who was there. Uh, so he asked that doctor to kind of operate on him. But because there was no medical facilities, no hospital, the doctor refused to do that because there was no anesthesia um, also there. So, um, and, and Major Cardoz knew that if he, if he uh, does not cut off the leg, the septicemia can spread to his entire body. So he asked his helper, you know, and 
in, in Indian Army, helper is a buddy, you know, a soldier who kind of stays with you throughout uh, the tough times and so on and so forth. But the helper also refused to cut off his leg of his master in that sense. So, and so left with no choice, um, Major Karthos took a kukri and cut it off himself. And once he cut off that leg himself, he said to the helper, now go and bury it. The incident would have meant the end of his field duty because for an officer, typically, if you are not uh, physically able, you know, you're not supposed to serve in forge. Physical fitness is a very important thing. Um, and it could have really meant the end of his military life. Uh, but knowing Major Cardoz, who's fondly called as Karpuz Sahab, he valiantly fought for Commander uh, Pitch when he was uh, set up for promotion. He surpassed his physically abled fellow officers in all the physical tests, despite not having that leg. And he actually became the first army officer who was disabled and was actually leading a battalion, not only as a full colonel, but as a brigadier. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, brigade is a much, is a culmination of two uh, different units and it could amass more than 2000 men on ground. So that's what he is. And this is the third principle of resilience, which I call improvise with what you have. You may not get the ideal situation every time, but make do with what you have at your current disposal and see what you can make out of it. Another term that we use for it is what's called the bricolage, which is the ability to make do with whatever you have in hand. And for doing that, you fundamentally need a change in mindset. Yeah. And ask yourself this very simple questions and shift your mindset from a cause oriented thinking to a response or solution oriented thinking. You know, typically as human beings, you know, the moment some problem occurs, we find, want to find out what was the cause of it, what was the reason of it, who is there to blame, so on and so forth. Yeah. We survey, if you want to be resilient, if you want to come out of the crisis stronger and faster and agile, then you need to shift your thinking from being cause-oriented to response-oriented. Yeah, And these are some of the questions that you can ask yourself to move on from that thinking to this thinking. Okay. I'm going to take a pause here and take any questions, um, uh, you know, if you have. I'll share these slides with all of you, uh, Nitesh, in case that's helpful. There were a couple of things more that I wanted to discuss, but I'm going to leave them with you to see if you have any questions or thoughts um, around this particular topic that we discussed today. Okay, I do see some comments in the chat. Anuj, okay, you've taken out that quote and I think this resonates with you, right? Okay. Super, uh, any questions, thoughts, points of view? Hi, good evening, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, Divya, you are. Uh, thank you for the insightful uh, session on adversity. Uh, I had one question in mind. So uh, being, uh, uh, resilient, uh, being resilient and uh, having to deal with adversity for an entrepreneur would mean uh, uh, dealing with failure in a better way, bouncing back from failure. So um, can you share your thoughts on how one deals with failure? Because we encounter it every day whether we do small things or we try to achieve a larger goal? Um, I have a couple of principles that I have followed, Divya, in my life. I'm not sure if these will resonate with you. But, um, um, but what I can share with you is, um, you know, it's not easy, first of all, just when you say, you know, uh, take failure as an opportunity to improve. 
all of us are wired for success, aren't we? As children, when we were raised, um, our mothers clapped when we came first in the race or second in the race. Our teachers, um, you know, really appreciated us or at least the top five and 10 in the class and admonished the rest of us who were not really there. So, um, you know, somehow, unfortunately, failure is underappreciated and achievement is overappreciated. That's the fundamental truth of life. Having said that, um, if you look at some of um, the historical path breaking breakthrough innovations that have come through, they have not come until those people have fundamentally, truly, and failed multiple times. Um, you know, I, I can quote hundreds of examples here, but if I have to quote only one, I will choose Edison's quote when he says that I have not failed. I have just tried 10,000 different ways of doing the same thing. Yeah. So um, strategy that can work and which has worked for me is um, it's okay to feel upset. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel, um, uh, you know, down, but it's not okay to stay there. It's not okay to go in a state of, uh, unending, um, you know, uh, uh, what you call well to say, I can't come out of it. So a couple of things. One, uh, self-introspect, um, keep 15 minutes for yourself every day uh, to give yourself a pat on the back on what you have done well um, and note down what you could have done better. Not give it the term failure, give it what it could you have done better. You've not failed, you've just tried it in a different way. Build a circle of friends, supporters, networks, who can pep you up in your feeling down. Um, again, as I said, you know, books that you read and people that you meet can change the trajectory of your life. So make sure that you have a mentor board of at least five different people from five different fields of work at five different ages whom you can reach out to when you are feeling down and when you are facing failure and when you need that point of view. And the last, which, I, which is what you can do yourself is the 4F formula, fail fast and fail forward. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing. You're welcome, Diva. All the very best. Uh, hi, uh, ma'am. This is Nirdesh, this side. Hi, Nirdesh. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for this uh, insightful session. Um, I had a little question around the uh, notion of realistic optimism and uh, you know its importance and resilience. Uh, I have a kind of a contradicting opinion uh, given the fact uh, or or uh, with reference to the saying that go for the best, but prepare for the worst. So how would you like to link both of these things together? Like what I'm trying to say is like, uh, does being uh, pessimistic help us more because uh, that helps us uh, prepare for the worst case scenarios? And obviously, yes, optimism here and there is uh, definitely fine. But how about being, how, how about taking up pessimism as a, as a means of uh, uh, building up resilience? Or, or is it always a negative uh, negative uh, attribute being passive? So, okay, fundamentally, um, you know, I am, I am personally not a binary person. Um, you know, while there are terms and we grew up learning antonyms and synonyms as we grew up as children, um, I am fundamentally against the notion of success and failure, uh, pessimism and optimism, as much as I've used, and I'll come to that what I'm saying. I typically see these terms and these traits as a continuum, Nirdesh, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, you know, So um, while on one end of the spectrum there is optimism, the other end is pessimism. Uh, I personally feel there are situations, there are contexts, there are um, you know, personalities, there are ways of looking things where people may lie at a continuum. In, in one situation, you may be totally optimistic. In other situation, given the context, and the frame of mind that you're in, you may feel pessimistic, you know? So these are like continual things. But I kind of like the way you have spelled it. In fact, in my definition of things, um, realistic optimism is actually bordering on pessimism because the reality of the situation may be so bleak uh, in the context that it's actually um, asking, it's telling you a brutal reality, you know? There's nothing that looks rosy in this situation, right? Uh, but having said that, 
how do you still maintain a sense of inner calm to say that you know there is pessimism there is difficulty there is the situation doesn't look great but internally can i maintain a peace of calm and look at a futuristic disposition that things will get better that is where you know the, the difference between what i what you said rightly about so can, do i not let myself drown in the stark reality you know or do i look at this reality as a means of a springboard to say this is a reality but i can i use my optimism to um, you know bounce forward does it answer your question yeah Thank you very much for the for those words. Welcome. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I'm Pulkit this side. Uh, ma'am, firstly, thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing session. It was really insightful. Uh, ma'am, I have a question from my own personal life, which I wanted to put forward. Uh, ma'am, I completed my graduation as an engineer, and then then I joined uh, Volvo Group. But I always knew that I am not made up for a corporate life. I want just wanted to start something of my own, and uh, I think this thought. Was stuck in my mind during my college life itself, and uh, after college, when I started with my corporate life, I tried my hands at different projects. Firstly, I started with an EV project where I worked with with one of my friends, and uh, we worked on an automobile uh, EV rickshaw. But somehow it didn't work out because the uh, prototype could not get approved, and we were financially locked up. And uh, so I thought, oh yes, that uh, let's try and do uh, my hand or something different. So I've always been always a music enthusiast also. so i set up my own uh, electro music festival brand in the name of atmos we did a lot of good events in lucknow and delhi and i thought that i'll be taking it forward on a wider scale probably as sanban or something but uh, since we last year we had corona situation and then we initially had to shut it down so at that point of time it struck in my mind that it's better to maybe pro- probably go for a formal degree as of now rather than start something because at this situation i d- really didn't have anything to do uh so ma'am sometimes when i try to introspect i really feel that am i not resilient enough to uh, you know keep on sticking to a particular idea because uh, i try to find the best solution to a you know to a, to a situation at that point of time and maybe try to diverge myself but this thought always comes into my mind because when i read stories about different entrepreneurs how they stuck to their idea for so many years and then they eventually worked it out and uh, i did not even really try to you know stick to it for different reasons altogether but uh, i mean <laughs> i just want to your introspection on that what would be your your views so um pulkit right yes ma'am pulkit thank you for asking that question and thank you for sharing that context uh, and let me first congratulate you first of all um you know on your on your on your optimism on your enthusiasm and on the courage to pursue an entrepreneurial venture you know believe you me at 41 also i had to muster a lot of courage to say you know i want to be on my own and you know leaving that sense of security of you know a paycheck a status and so on and so forth it's it's not easy it's tough um, it requires a lot of moral courage to do that to answer your question do i not have resilience to do it um i can't give you a yes or a no answer to this uh, because i need to understand the context a little more but i'll give you some thoughts to think through maybe um and and this is basis again some of the discussions and research that i've done so we all know that 9 out of 10 entrepreneurial ventures fail yeah that's that's a reality um uh, having said that uh, does that mean your venture will also fail maybe no Uh, and a lot of the research that you would also have done on existing uh, entrepreneurs you will realize that um, those people one had a very strong conviction and belief in the idea that they were pursuing um so you will have to question yourself on the idea that you are pursuing one what is the belief what is the conviction that i have internally the second is matching it to reality you know what is the context what is the market what is uh, the opportunity who's the customer so on and so forth and you will have to find a good fit in that i'm again going to refer to jim collins book he's given a hedgehog concept there very interesting concept he says if you plot three circles in your life you will find the first circle to be named as the passion that you have okay then there's a concentric circle again that you can plot which is um 
what does the world need okay and the third circle which intersects the second both the circles is what can generate economic value so at the intersection of these three circles if you can position your entrepreneurial idea is where the chances of success increase many fold um and which is also similar to the concept of ikigai nidesh what you said is right and it's a similar concept which is there in jim collins book but you'll find enough and more examples where he's shared this this thing in detail so to answer your question pulke two three things one you may want to introspect and reflect on what is your passion really right and can that passion generate economic value and the kind of conviction that you have to pursue that passion and those questions only you can answer you may want to use a mentor or a coach as a sound board to really see the strength of your ideas but the answers will only come within you the second thought that i'm leaving you with is context is king so in the current situation uh you know you may not want to question yourself on your resilience believe you me with whatever we are wherever we have um survival is good enough at this point in time as they say this too shall pass right and then you can figure out what are some of the other ways and means to rebuild on your entrepreneurial passion this is not the end of the world you have a whole life ahead of you to keep experimenting if i can experiment at 42 i'm sure you can experiment at 25 or 26 so um and again you know and read a book by peter thiel it it's the name of the book is 0 to 1 it talks all about entrepreneurship um you may draw some ideas from there thank you so much sir feel free to connect with me one on one if you feel there are more questions that you need answer to happy to definitely um hello ma'am गुरु और नितेश or maybe a uh, kanagraj professor kanagraj and then they can circulate to all of you would that be all right sure ma'am that would do all right thank and you i'll do that but couple of ones that i mentioned here is what can benefit you know zero to one man search for meaning jim collins good to great. Good to great yeah these are things that you can uh, of course pick up immediately I, and i'm not sure if you've read seven habits of highly effective people which is stephen covey um which also as a manager is i think it's a good good time for you to start reading on that also um um what else you may want to pick up carol dweck growth mindset again a very good book on how growth mindset can help you develop as a person and a professional but apart from that let me compile and um, i'll share it um you know with all of you thank you so much ma'am it's been a pleasure attending your session same here i think i thoroughly enjoyed out of the last one year that i have taken a couple of sessions for a lot of colleges this is the one that i have enjoyed most so thank you for inviting me nikesh thank you so much ma'am and just on behalf of the entire batch uh just to discuss a few points ma'am uh, we spoke about discipline moral courage uh, values uh, we spoke about your personal journey which is pretty amazing and uh, you speak from experience when you talk about disruption we learned about the cardinal rules of disruption and so many different insights ma'am like uh, thoroughly enjoyed the session and so much to learn from you ma'am you to be an inspiration and thank you so much for taking the time out really appreciate it it's a pleasure again thank you so much there were a lot of questions i think that a lot of you asked in the chat my apologies in the given time frame i have not been able to address all of them But as I mentioned, uh, feel free to write to me. Let me just type in my um, email ID if you already don't have one here. And um, 
Uh, I think I can, yeah, feel free to, as I said, you know, write to me um, and run past me any question that you might have. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you would want to. Thank you so much and all the very best to all of you for uh, this tenure in time in um, Exilerai, one of the most prestigious institutions in the country and all the very best to you for your future careers. I'm sure all of you will thrive and be successful. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.